Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could be here today in the house of the Lord. And Lord, we pray that you would be with us, all the ones that could not be here today. And I pray that you would uh, be with the, uh, the elderly that uh, can't, can't come to church anymore, Lord. I pray that uh, you would uh, just uh, be with our country today, Lord. And I pray that you would be with our president. And uh, I pray that you would be with his heart and his, uh, his decision making. And uh, Lord, I pray that today uh, you would help us to examine our hearts so that, uh, so that we would repent for our sins. And Lord, uh, I pray that you just help us to have a Christ-like appearance. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today that needs Jesus in their heart, I pray that you'd give them the courage to uh, come forward and surrender their heart. And Lord, I pray that uh, you be with Brother David as he preaches the message. And I pray that you uh, just give us the strength, the courage, and the wisdom to do your work. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Boys and girls, off they go. James is in the lead. Alright. Children's Church. As they're going, I would just remind you that, um, of course, it's, it's on the back of the Cypress Heart. Uh, we're talking about the third anniversary of the Hopkins on the field with us. Certainly, they have been with us uh, longer than that in terms of call, uh, but there was a little gap there when they were taking care of the fire and all that. Yeah. Mission strength and uh, that's kind of a cross between the choir and the mission thing. That's it. Okay. So, have you ever had a realization that you could know someone beyond just your daily experience with that person? Because you've been around them so long that you knew who they were as a person in their heart, as Jeremy was talking about, Frank, our president. That you knew their heart so that regardless of the, the good days or the bad days along the way, you knew that person who they were. And, and unfortunately for us, we don't have a tendency to think of God in that way. That I've been in His Word and, and I've responded to His call of salvation and, and I now, because I've been walking with the Lord, there may be some times where I feel uh, convicted about sin or I need that, that repentance is needed as we pray about today. Uh, there are times of, of great joy in the presence of God and and excitement about the things that God's done in the world. And, and we have a tendency to reduce it to little experiences rather than understanding what he's been up to from before the foundation of the earth until this time. And it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. God as Father, Son, and Spirit, one God in three distinct persons has been in fellowship within himself for all eternity. You say... Well, now, when did God start? So I'm going to tell you today. Sarah's been waiting for me to tell you when God started. And this is how it works. God created time. And nothing before that point started or ended. Because you have to have time for something to start or to end. So God has always existed... And he created time. So what's he been doing? All of that non-time. He has been planning fellowship with you. In fact, Jesus says to his disciples, 
In John chapter 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I return, I'm going to receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Even eternity is all about fellowship. God is desiring. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need anything. That he is desiring to have fellowship with us. And so, even if you think about the Garden of Eden. Let's go back over here to the Garden of Eden. And here's Adam and Eve. And, and the scripture says that the pre-incarnate Christ, as we understand it, God, met with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Now, how many of you understand the cool of the day by now? Right? <laughs> a, a good friend and, uh, and a relative by marriage now is here with us. She's here from California. She's used to hot. Uh, but she decided she was going to enjoy a little bit of Southeast Texas this morning outside. And very wisely chose the cool of the day. And as you're talking about the fact that the Lord walked with Adam and Eve in fellowship. There's no sin. And in the cool of the day they met. And they met face to face. It was all about relationship. The fall into sin. When Adam and Eve listened to the serpent. And decided that they were missing out on something. Because the servant said, there's more there. God's holding out on you. And they chose to believe that. Whenever we choose to believe that the world, the flesh, that anything has something more for us than God does, we're being deceived. And so they were deceived. And they bought into it. And they joined Satan's rebellion, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him. My, my grandsons are very fond of dragons at these days. And so we call him the great dragon and they're like, ooh, creepy. Ah. So as you look at all of this theme through history, the great battle in heaven and the fall of, of Lucifer from his place and the demons that fall with him, the third of the angels of heaven become demons. And, and all of this big picture... You and I, we appear just for a short time. Jesus says, it's a very, it's like a vapor. We appear. And yet somehow or another, God is taking all of these little individual lives who respond to his call for relationship. And he's making them his own. And he's planning on then keeping them in His grace and in His salvation, not only through their time as a, just a wisp, as a, a vapor in this life, but for all eternity. How do they get there? How do they get to be a part of what God is doing? And that's what we're going to look at today. Have, how many of you have ever heard of a, a man named Lou Wallace? Lou Wallace. And Dan's raising his hand because he likes history and that sort of thing. Lou Wallace, if you look at your Cypress heart, it tells a little bit about him. He lived in the 19th century. He was in the Mexican-American War. Uh, he met Abraham Lincoln during that time. He wound up being called upon by Lincoln in, in the military and everything then to serve the nation during the Civil War. But all of those things, there's like, mean nothing to you. How about if I say he wrote the book that became the movie, Ben-Hur. Now if he likes, come on. He wasn't a believer. He wasn't a believer. It wasn't that he was hostile against God or antagonistic against God. As opposed to some of the people that he dealt with in his time. He just had never been in the Word of God, nor had he ever taken it seriously. Now, some very tragic things happened in his life, but he was a person who wanted to grow, he wanted to develop, and he read a story about, in Scripture, about the three wise men, and he was excited about that story. And so he was going to write an article about it, and a great atheist from his time period uh, and some of y'all have read the Cypress Heart. I've had people come to me and say, there's a word in here. And this word said that this guy filleted him. I said, no. Filleted. It's a French word, y'all. You use it all the time. Filleted. 
the atheist basically said to Lou Wallace, you can't preach against the Bible or talk about anything in it unless you know the Bible. And he was so convicted by this man's thought. He said, you know, I'm right. I, I, he's right. I'm ashamed of myself that I would even begin to write or to talk about anything. He says, I had no convictions about God or Christ. I neither believed or disbelieved them. Yet, when the work was fairly begun, I found myself writing reverently with awe. Still, Wallace had much to learn about God as he found out the chance encounter with Robert Ingersoll, our atheist. Uh, and as it goes on, he says, my ignorance of the scripture was painfully a, a spot of deeper darkness in the darkness. I was ashamed of myself. And as he goes on, it says that as he wrote his character, Judah ben Hur, who, by the way, was actually one of the, that name is one of Solomon's uh, inner counsel. He just borrowed the name. Uh, that he began to look at the life and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus through the eyes of his character, and he came to faith in Christ. How many people have examined the scripture and have allowed God to speak into their heart? Well, today we're going to look at John chapter 1, just several verses, but I, I'm not going to tell you all about these verses. They're on the wall. You're welcome to look in your word. But there they are. The scripture was saying that from the very beginning, the word has been. We don't know from this particular section of scripture who that word is. We're going to find out as we go through. But notice that the word was God. The word was with God from the very beginning back there. Of course, anything before the beginning of time is existing before time. So, this word is the light that shines in darkness. We need to understand that because the darkness that has come into our world as a result of sin is great. And we need light. So, if you look in the same chapter in verse 10, now you see he was in the world. The world was made through him. So, whoever the word is, is actually the one who was causing things to happen for the world to be created, yet the world did not know them. Came to his own, now referring to the Jewish people. His own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, Savior, right? That he was the one to save. He gave the right to become children of God. So, if a person wants to be saved, if a person wants to be a child of God, Jesus is the word who can do that. Look in verse 13. 